Okay, so mine is I don't know how to do it. Oh, it's just a just a little bit of a little bit of a little bit of a little bit of a uh, so we're picking up where we left off at the end of the last lecture. So we're talking about lists. Um, so I'm just going to do a little example here where we're using a list um, to help us compute uh, or to help us perform a very simple simulation. All right. So the simulation that I want to run is I want to simulate the rolling of two dice and I would like to compute the probability of. Um, so what are the odds of rolling, say, for example, an eight? Right. In fact, I want to enumerate all the possibilities. So I want to enumerate what's possibly rolling a two, a three, a four, and so on up to 12. Right now, most of you are probably taking the statistics course, so you can easily do this um, analytically. Right. Uh, but if you didn't know what the answer was, yep. Yeah. Awesome. So maybe you don't know how to do this analytically. All right. So um, some of you must have taken the statistics course. Yes, one. <laughs> you got one person who's taken a stats course. Do you not do it in high school anymore? You don't do probability? Oh, OK, that's interesting. Um, so uh, sure, well, well, I mean, it's pr this is a pretty simple problem, right? The odds of rolling two dice. Um, so uh, if you don't know what the analytic answer is, you can easily simulate it, right? So the idea is, is you just simulate uh, randomly rolling two dice, compute their sum, and keep track of how many times you rolled, say, a two and a three, and so on and so on and so forth. So I want to use a list to keep track of how many times did I roll a two and a three and so on and so forth. So basically, I want to reproduce this um, table. I want to reproduce this table. So the first column is just going to be the index that I'm using to access the list, right? So I'm going to have a list that's got um, uh, at index zero and one. Obviously, we're not going to compute the probability of rolling those two values because you can't roll a zero or one with the two dice, right? And then two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, up to twelve. Um, the uh, corresponding index in the list will store something related to the probability of rolling that value. Okay, so to simulate rolling two, uh, to simulate rolling um, a dice or a die, sorry, um, you can use the class uh, Java Util uh, Random uh, to do this. So the random class is a uh, deterministic random number generating class. Uh, so it's deterministic so that it's not really random. The sequence that it produces seems random, um, but if you actually know where the, what the starting point of the random number generator is, you can actually predict the sequence of values that the random number uh, generator will produce. Um, you'll probably, I'm guessing, you will probably never learn how these things work. Um, I guess those of you in applied math might, at some point, uh, encounter how these things work. Uh, if you want to know how the Java one works, you can click on uh, that link. The first link is right there. Um, there's a lot of mathematics involved in gener in producing these random number generators. Uh, who is I guess the people who are, who do who do cryptography are very interested in generating um, random numbers, and they're useful in lots of other places as well. Okay, right, so the basic idea is is um, all I'm going to do is I'm going to make a list. I'm going to add 13 zeros to the list, right? Because I want to keep track of the values uh, zero through 12, right? And I'm going to ignore the values for zero and one. I'm going to repeat the following n times. So I'm going to roll two dice n times, where n is some large-ish number. So I'm going to roll. Uh, I'm going to use the random number class, the random class, to generate two values between one and six. I'm going to sum the values, right, to get the value x. Right. I'm going to look in the list at the index x and see how many values are there. Then I'm going to add one to that value. And then I'm going to, uh, after I've done rolling the dice n times, I'm going to divide every element in the list by n, right? Uh, the claim is if n is large and if the random number generator is fair, uh, you'll get a reasonable estimate of the um, odds or probability of rolling the two dice. Right. So I'm going to do this in Eclipse. I'm going to try to do this on uh, without having the solution in front of me. So please bear with me. 
All right, so there's our dicey. Oh, wait, can you, um, is this big enough for everybody? Do I have to fiddle with the font? Can you read that at the back? You okay? Okay. Um, so step one, make a list and fill it with uh, 13 zeros. So the only list we know of right now is array list. So I'm going to do it this way, right? And then you want the element type. So I'm going to keep track of the number of times we've rolled a value so I can use integer here, right? Now, remember when you're making a list, right? You can't make a list of ints. You have to use the corresponding wrapper class, so I need to make an array list of integer. So I guess I'm just going to call this counts or something like that, right? And then, like any other object, you call a constructor. Sorry, you could use new, uh, and then you call a constructor, right? So remember the constructor for array list. Well, it's the exact same right. name as the class, right? And remember the funny notation that we have to use in this particular example. We're using these uh, angled braces or the angled brackets here. Right, and uh, the angled brackets indicates the element type to the array list. Right, you only use the angled brackets when you're using classes uh, that are called generic classes. Uh, so generic classes are classes where you can specify information about the type that the class is using. Right, array list happens to be one of those classes. Most classes are not generic, so normally you don't use this uh, syntax. So there's my list. I want to populate it with 13 zeros, so I just need a loop that runs 13 times. Right now, depending on who taught you um, your first programming courses, they might complain about that 13, right? I claim that this program is small enough that you don't really care that that's 13 and not a constant. Uh, so I want to fill the list with 13 zeros. So I'm going to do counts, right? So remember to add something to a list. Uh, the method is called add. Right? You specify the value that you would like to add to the list. So I want to add a zero 13 times. And let's just stop there and print out the list. Let's see what we get. Oops, sorry. All right, so Java is nice. You can print out anything in Java. You don't always get the thing that you want. You don't always get the string that you want when you print it out. Uh, but for lists, you do, right? So for lists, you get this nice, uh, this uh, nice representation of the list. Right? You get the square brackets to indicate the start and end of the list, and then the elements are printed. Um, you get the elements one at a time separated by commas and uh, a space, a comma and a space. All right, so there's my list, so that's good. So I have thir if you were to count, you'd actually have 13 zeros there. Oh, so we don't need that right now. Um, so the next step is I want to roll a pair of dice um, n times. So I guess I should pick a value for n. Now it's convenient to create a variable uh, because I might want to change n. Okay, so n is equal to, so I'm just going to do this 100 times. Let's see what we get. Um, if I'm going to do this n times, I need a loop. So another loop. Roll two dice. So now I need a random number generator to roll the dice. Um, so I can make the random number generator in the loop, but I'm going to use the same object over and over and over again. If I make it inside the loop, it's going to recreate the object over and over and over again. So that's a bit wasteful. So outside of the loop or before the loop, I'm going to make our random number generator object. So the class is called random. I'm just going to call it RNG for random number generator. You can just use R or something else. Uh, it's, an, it's a reference type or it's a, so random is a class. So if I want to make an object, I use new, call a constructor. So the name of the class is called random. Uh, it turns out that you can just use the no argument constructor in this case that creates a random number generator. Um, every random, well, sorry, all of the Java random number generators have what's called a seed. So the seed is just a starting point for the random number generator. If you call the no argument constructor, you get the um, you get a random number generator that's seeded with the current time. Right? If you wanted to, you can specify the seed. So inside the round brackets, you can put in a long value. So 0L, for example, or 1L, or whatever long value you would like. Right? Uh, if you set the seed, then that lets you reproduce the sequence of random numbers. Right? So any random number generator that you start with a seed equal to X will always produce the same sequence. Right? So you can now use this. Uh, somebody else can make a random number generator that's seeded with X, and it will produce the exact same sequence um, that uh, yours will produce. 
right? And so that lets you reproduce um, the sequence of random values uh, that the random number generator is producing, right? That's useful for debugging. Um, it's useful if you need reproduce if you need something that's random, but you still need it to be reproducible, right? A lot of video games um, will start uh, will see will use seeds for their random number generators. Um, if you can figure out the seeds, you can actually uh, it's easy to break the or break or exploit the video game. Okay, so random, I need to import that. So that's in the uh, package Java util, right? Uh, array list is also in util. Uh, many of the classes that we'll be using from the standard library are in Java util, right? Util is just short for utility, right? So useful classes. Okay, I've got my random number generator. I've got my loop. I would like to roll two uh, six-sided dice, right? So I'm just gonna call the values X and Y. So the way you use the random number generator, you ask the random number generator to generate a uh, random int. And so when you when this thing pops up, you'll notice there's a bunch of options here. If I go to the next int, all right, that one tells you that it produces the next, um, it produces a random integer value between, oh, oh, so, so, so between uh, minus integer min value and positive integer max value. Right? That'll generate any random int. That's not what I want. I, a, I want a random int between zero, uh, sorry, between one and six. So if I pick the next one, all right, that one tells you it generates a random number between zero uh, and bound minus one. All right, so uh, this one does not include the bound. So that's the one I want. So I want next int. All right, so if I put in a six, that gives me a random number between zero and five. All right, again, the bound is not, the upper bound is not included. Right. So to get a random number between one and six, just add one. Right, add one to the result. Right, don't add one to the six. Right, if you put in seven, you would get a random number between zero and six. So you'd have a seven-sided die that sometimes rolls zero. Right. If you're using a newer version of the JDK, um, you can use a lower and upper bound. So in a newer version, which I don't have on this computer, you could write one and six. Uh, sorry, one and seven, and that works. Right, so so I'll just leave that in there, and I'll put in the one that works on my computer on the next line. I'm going to do the same thing for Y. Right, so every time you call one of these next methods, um, it gives you a new random number. Right. You can generate random ints, you can generate random floats, uh, doubles, uh, you can do random booleans as well. Okay, so now you just sum the two values, so the sum is just x plus y. And now I'm going to look up the sum in my list. Right. The, way I, the way you look up the sum is you just go into the list and uh, grab the value at that index. Yeah, question. Yeah. That's just the way it works. So the the way that the um, class is defined is that the upper bound is not included. Uh, what's next? Um, so x y. Uh, oh, now I'm going to look up the uh, number, the current number of counts uh, for the value x. Uh, for sorry, for the value sum. So int uh, That's just so I have to ask the list now for the element at index x. So I have to ask the list. So counts dot and the method is called get. Sum. So that gets the value at index sum. I want to add one to cur and I want to put it back into the list. So I want to add one to cur. Right, because we just rolled one of those. And now I want to put that value back into the list. So to put the value back into the list, you use set. Right, and the index is sum. Right, and the value is now cur. Right, and so that rolls, that simulates rolling the dice um, n times. Right, okay, so after doing that, um, I mean, let's look at the list again. So let me grab that line of code there. Put it in there and see what we get. So if you run that, um, you get those values there. 
Right, so notice that to, uh, the odds, so the number of times we rolled zero and one is zero, which is good. Right. Um, we rolled a two once, we rolled a 12 zero times, right? And notice, of course, that it peaks somewhere in the middle. Hopefully it peaks around seven because seven is the most likely value um, that you get when you're rolling two dice. Right. And notice that it's, uh, if you look carefully at that distribution of values, it's not quite symmetric, right? You would kind of expect that the number of times you roll a five is equal to the number of times you roll an, sorry, six is equal to the number of times that you roll an eight, right? The number of times you roll a five is equal to the number of times you roll a nine and so on and so forth, right? So you expect this distribution to be peaked in the middle and symmetric. Um, it's not quite, but that's because it's random. Right? You crank up this number to a thousand, say. Right, still not symmetric, right? 152, 153 and 136 on either side. Right, 103 and 113 on either side, right? And if you keep on making this number larger and larger and larger, so now it's 100,000, right? Right, it's going to get closer and closer and closer to being uh, symmetric. Um, and if you make this number infinitely large, you will actually get a, a true, um, uh, the true estimate of the odds. Now, if you wanted the odds, all you have to do is go in and divide the count um, by the number of times you rolled the dice. Right. So write another loop. Oh, actually, uh, let's do it this way instead. So now we can use a for, um, for this one, I'm going to use a for each loop. Right. So for each at int, uh, C int counts. Oops. So I'm just going to print out the value of C divided by the number of times we rolled the dice. So C divided by N. Let's see what we get. All right. Oh, we get all zeros, which is not good. Where did my list go? Oh, I didn't. Sorry, I didn't print it out anymore. Right. So that's weird. Right. Anybody see what the problem is? Yeah. It's an down to the yeah, it's int divided by int, right? So all the values should be less than one because these are percentage, these are percentages or odds, right? Uh, and so it always truncates down to zero, right? So the problem is when I did c divided by n, c is an int, n is an int, right? I really want to do floating point arithmetic, so I have to force one of c or n to be a double. It doesn't matter which one in this case, so I'm going to force c to be a double. Run it again. Why don't I print out the value of uh, i at the same time so this is a little easier to read? So I'm going to print out i plus a colon. That. Right. Sorry, there is no i. I'm being a dummy. Oh, I guess I should have used the counting style loop here. Um, and i equals zero. Like that. Is there a problem? It's complaining about something. System out. What's the problem? Uh, but, but, uh, is there really a bug? Is there really an issue here? Oh, yeah, there's an extra round bracket. There we go. Okay. Now, let's see what we get. There we go. Uh, and so. Uh, if you if you read the odd if you read the values as percentages, right, the odds of rolling a two is about two point eight percent, right? The odds of rolling a three is about five point six, and so on and so on and so on, right? The odds of rolling a seven is uh, about sixteen point six, and if you go back to the slide, right, uh, there are the true odds. If you were uh, there are the true odds for a pair of fair dice, right? And you can see that the uh, estimated that the simulated values are close to the true probabilities. Right, they're not exactly the same, right? Again, because this is all random, right? As you increase the value of n, the uh, the values that are generated by the simulation will approach the true values um, that are shown on the slide. All right, so there's a very simple example of using a list, right? Constructor on this line, right? The add method on this line here to add values to the newly constructed um, list. Uh, there's get, 
right? Retrieve a value from the list. There's set, replace a value in the list. Uh, and there, oh, it was there. You can print out a list. So if you uh, want to get, uh, if you want to quickly look at the values in a list, you can just print it out. It always works, right? And um, there's an example of using the random num uh, the random class. Right? Constructor, right? Uh, next int is here. Right. Um, if you look, if you were to look at the documentation for random, you'd see um, a bunch of other methods that start with next, uh, and those all generate um, random values of a particular type. All right. Any questions on how that little um, class or that little example works? All right. Uh, you can do the exact same thing with an array, right? So instead of using an array list, uh, you could just use an array. Right. So make an array of size 13 here. Right. And then instead of using get and set, use the square brackets right, to um, access the elements of the array. Um, I guess the important thing to point out here is that uh, lists are not the same as arrays. Right? So lists are resizable. Right? The syntax uh, for their use is very different compared to arrays. Right? A lot of new Java programmers, though, confuse the two. Right? And so, um, in both this course and in SIS 124, um, if I ask you on a test, use an array uh, to do something, right? inevitably I'll get a large fraction of students uh, using a list instead. right? Or if you say use an array list, a large fraction of the students will end up using an array. right? And then a disappointingly large fraction of students use something in between. right? And so they try to use an array list using the square bracket notations, or they try to use an array using the array list notation. Right. And so you have to make sure you don't confuse the two, right? They are these are two distinct things in the Java language. Right. If it's an array, then you use it like an array, right? But you ask if you're asked to use an array list, you have to use it as though it were a list. The main advantage of the array list over the array is that the array list is resizable. Right? So it automatically resizes itself. You don't have to worry about keeping track of the number of elements in the array or trying to expand the array or shrink the array when you need to. Okay, another, here's another example. I don't think I'm gonna do this one in class. Um, it's relatively easy to do. It's very similar to the one I just did, right? And so um, you might, uh, you can run a similar sim simulation to calculate the odds of, uh, to calculate odds related to flipping a coin or a fair coin, All right? So for example, if you were to flip a coin N times, uh, how often would you expect to see uh, n over four heads, right? Or one head or zero heads, right? Or zero tails or something like that, right? Um, if you know anything about stats, it turns out this is just the binomial distribution. So we know what the answer is uh, analytically. Again, you could simulate this, right? You just perform this series of steps, right? So you make a list, you add n plus ones, n plus one zeros to the list, right? Because you're going to flip it n times, right? And you're going to count the uh, number of times that the you're going to count the number of heads uh, that appear. You want to count the number of times where zero head appears, one head appears, up to n heads appear. Right? So you need n plus one elements in the list. Right? Now you just flip the coin m times, right? Count the number of heads that you um, get and update the list with the number of heads that you get. When you're done, divide every element in the list by M, and you end up getting the odds of flipping a coin N times. Uh, sorry, you get the odds of seeing a head uh, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, up to N uh, times. So it's almost the exact same simulation. It just involves a nested loop. Right. Uh, you call next Boolean. Next Boolean or next? Uh, random? Next Boolean. So next Boolean generates true or false. Uh, at random, so you can just use next boolean to simulate flipping a coin, right? Because you have two, um, there are two outcomes for flipping a coin. I guess unless, uh, as long as you don't consider uh, landing on the edge of the coin, right? All right. Um, next set of slides. So this is still talking about lists. Um, so I'm going to show you more list methods. Where to go? 
There we go. Okay, so oh, there's the coin. Actually, the coin flipping code is right here, right? So if you want to try this in your uh, copious free time, right? You can uh, you can play it. You can um, either try it on your own or refer to this slide here. Um, this slide tells you how to uh, run that simulation. All right, so now I want to talk about lists, and um, there's going to be a lot of this method called sublist. So sublist turns out to be super handy in a lot of cases. Um, I'm going to also talk about recursion now because Java supports recursion, right? And hopefully you've done some recursion in your previous courses, right? So this is a good play. This is a good time to review it. Um, so I'm going to uh, we're going to try to play this game called Jump It. This is not this is not an exciting game, right? But it's a useful game to motivate this particular problem. So in Jump It, you've got this board. It's got n squares on it. Now when I say board, it's just an array, right? Or an array list. So it's got at least two squares on the board, right? The boards are numbered with a uh, positive, uh, non-negative integer, right? So the first one is zero. All the other ones are positive values, right? The goal is to start from the left. You want to move to the right-hand side of the board uh, by taking uh, one or two steps at every uh, move, right? You can only move to the right. So starting at the zero, I, oops, sorry. Starting at the zero, I can move to the three, or I can move to the 80. Every time you land on a square, you have to pay the cost of stepping on that square, right? So the cost is just the value that's sitting in that square, right? You would like to reach the end of the board uh, by accumulating the lowest possible score, right? or the lowest possible cost, sorry. Right? So for this particular example, right, you would like to move one step to the three, then to the two steps to the six, and then two steps to the 10, right, for a total cost of five, right? Obviously, if you took two steps at the beginning, you've got a cost of 80, and that's much bigger than five. Oh, sorry, 19. I guess I can't add. Sorry, total cost of, I summed the one, two, two. Sorry, it's the three, the, the zero, the three, the six, and the 10, so that's 19. Okay, so the question is, um, so look, the way, uh, if you look at this board, you say, well, the three is smaller than the 80, so of course I'm going to step on the three. Right now, when you're on the three, you say, well, the six is smaller than the 80, so of course I'm going to step on the six. Right. And then when you get to the six, you're going to say, well, the 50, uh, the 10 is smaller than the 57, so of course I'm going to step on the 10. Uh, and so the question that you can ask is, is should you always step on the square uh, with the lowest cost? And it turns out the answer is no, because um, it might be better to move a, to a square that has a higher cost because you would have ended up on that square anyway if you had taken the uh, lowest cost step uh, previously. Right? So for example, if I get to this point on the board and I say I'm going to step to the, each square that has the smallest next cost, right? you would go to the one because the one is less than five. Right Now your choice is the five and the six, so you'd go to the five. Right, And now your choice is the six or the one, so you would go to the one. Right? That's a total cost of 24. Right, but obviously, if you're at the 17, you could skip the one and just jump to the five. Right, and that actually produces a lower cost. OK, so if you were to try to solve this problem uh, on an arbitrary sized board, right, um, it's not entirely obvious how you would solve this problem. Right, it, it's, it's not clear that you can write a simple loop. Um, and it's inside the loop you do some simple logic to figure out which square to move to, right? If you try to do it that way, you're going to realize fairly quickly um, that you can't actually solve this problem that way, right? And so um, uh, it kind of looks like you're stuck trying to evaluate every possible set of moves. And so to evaluate every set, possible set of moves, it's also not clear how you're going to write that using just a loop or loops, right? Because at every step, you've got a choice of two different um, options, right? And then when you make that choice, you've got another set of two options. And when you make that choice, uh, that choice, you've got another set of two options, and so on, and so on, and so on. All right, so um, uh, one possible way to solve this problem is to use recursion, right? Um, and so when you're uh, doing, uh, when you're attempting to solve a problem recursively, right, um, remember that the idea is is that you're going to uh, take your function, right, and use the function to call itself, right? 
So every time you use the function to call itself, the idea is you're using the function to solve a smaller version of the same problem, right? As long as the size of the problem decreases every time you call the function, right? The function eventually reaches a point where it can uh, produce the solution, right? And then it can unwind itself and you can use that sub solution to figure out the solution to the rest of the problem. Uh, and so whenever you solve, a, whenever you attempt to create a recursive method, right, it's always super useful uh, to sketch out small versions of the problem. Now, unfortunately, I didn't do this on here, um, and I'm not sure there's a good place to do it on the. Let's pop that up for a second. Now, the smallest size of the problem is a board of size two, so that looks like a good place to start. Well, if you get from there to there, you've only got one choice, right? So you know the solution, right? So n equals two, right? The solution is take one step. So that is easy. All right, so it looks like if you can get down to a board of size two, you know the answer. Uh, but if you get down to a board of size three, you also know the answer. So you see that. On a board of size three, if you're here, you just skip the middle square. So the middle square is always positive. So that's easy as well. So now you're going to take a step in size two, right? Now, what about n equals four? Right. And so when you get to the n equals four situation right now, this is the point where you don't know what the answer is, right? You're either going to go one and then one, oh, sorry, one and then two, right? Notice that when you go one, Right, you're left with a board of size three, right? And you know the answer to a board of size three, right? Now that might not be the correct answer. So maybe you're going to go two, right? And notice that after you take a step of size two, you end up with a board of size two, and you know the answer to that, right? So here you know the answer as well, right? It's the minimum of taking one step and then solving the rest of the board, right? Or taking two steps and solving the rest of the board. So grand equal four, right? It's the min of uh, uh, taking one step. Yeah, this is about horrible. Taking one step and then solving the n equals three case, right? Or taking two steps, Solving the end equals three. Uh, and so once you've got that point there, right, your recursive algorithm is basically done, right? There are your there are your base cases. That's your recursive case, right? So I'm just going to use the function to solve the smaller case here, right? I'm going to recursively call the function to solve the smaller case here. Those are your two base cases. So those are your two endpoints. Right, and so it's very easy. Uh, this is a particularly simple problem uh, to solve using recursion. Right, so if your board has size two, you're done. Right, you've got no choice in your movement. Right, you must move the one square. Oh, sorry, hang on. Uh, so for a board of size two, you know the answer. Right, the total cost is just the current square that you're on plus the um, plus this uh, plus the cost of the second square, right? If the board is um, has a size of three, then your cost is just the current location, right? Plus uh, the cost of the third square on the board. Right? And so, if you're going to uh, write this solution, that uh, you're going to create a method to solve this problem recursively, right? You would write something as uh, like the following. I'm going to call it cost. The cost is uh, some int value, so it's going to return an int. 
the board, I'm just going to represent the board using a list. Right? Uh, now, the reason I'm using a list instead of an array is because at some point I need to figure out uh, what is the, I want to be able to figure out what is the rest of the board. Right? And it turns out there's a really convenient method uh, in list to get the rest of the board or to get a chunk of the board. Right? You could do this with an array as well, but then you end up passing around an index. Um, and so that gets, uh, it's not difficult to do, but um, it's uh, it's a little bit cleaner doing uh, using a list. So if my board has size two, I know the answer, so I can immediately return the cost. Right, the cost of that board is just the current value. Is just this, uh, sorry, is the cost of the current square plus the cost of the next square. If the board has size three, I also know the answer. Right, it's the cost of the current square plus the cost of the squared um, two to the right. If you're not in either one of these cases, right, you fall into the recursive case. Right. So in the recursive case, you want to say, well, I'm going to take one step to the right. Right. I know what that cost is because I can look at the value to the right. Right. And then I'm going to try to figure out the cost of the rest of the board. Similarly, uh, you have a choice of moving two squares. Right. So I can look at the cost of the square that's two away from me, and then I can figure out the cost of the rest of the board. And then I'm going to return the smaller of those two costs. So in Java, this has a particularly simple solution. Right? So what I'm going to do is I want to I want to look at the board right after taking one step. Right. And so that's the board not including the first square. Right. Or that's the list not including the first element. Right? And so there's a method called sublist that gives you the list between a starting and stopping index. So uh, not including the stopping index. So it's sort of like next int. It doesn't include the second. Uh, it doesn't include the upper bound. Right. So sublist one and board dot size or a list called board gives you back the part of board that does not include the first element. Right, so it gives you back the part of board that starts at index one, goes to the end of the board. For the second case, where I take two steps, uh, a step, uh, yeah, two steps, right, or a step of size two, right, I'm going to ask the board for the sublist starting at index two, right, so the third, starting at the third element of the current board, right, and going to the end of the board. The cost of that, the cost that I have to incur right now is the cost of the square that I'm currently on, right? So that will get zero. Right. So the total cost is just C, right? Plus the smaller of the costs of solving that board or solving that board. Right. And I can figure out what the cost of solving a board is by calling cost. Right. So recursively call cost to figure out the cost of uh, after taking one step, right? And recursively call cost to compute the cost after taking two steps, right? And that gives you back, uh, and that will eventually find the uh, smallest cost um, to, for solving the board, right? When you use sublist, you get back the part of the list starting at that index going up to, but not including that index, right? The list that you get back is not a new list. Right, it's actually part of the existing list. Right, so if you modify the sublist using after one step or after two step, right. So for example, if you call set or add, right, then the original list also changes. When you call sublist, right, you get back a new, uh, you get back what something that looks like a new list. So the indexing of the sublist starts at zero. So when you ask for the sublist of the board starting at index one, right, the first element of after one step still has index zero, right? So that corresponds to index one of the original board. Right? The second element of after one step still has an index of one, but that corresponds to the element in board at index two, and so on and so on and so forth. Right. And so there's the recursive solution uh, for that um, for this problem here. Any questions? The only interesting thing here is the sublist method. Well, I mean, if I guess depending on how good your recursion is or how you uh, how able you are to think recursively, 
Uh, the only interesting point thing here is the selfless method. All right, so again, right in your copious free time, right? You might want to know uh, what is so you can figure out what the smallest cost is, but it might be useful to know what sequence of steps do you make to actually figure out what the smallest cost is, right? So you'd like to have the list of moves as well. Right, for example, to solve this board, I want to take a step size one and then two and then two. So it might be nice if I can get that list back out, right? That list one, two, two. Right. I claim you can uh, solve this problem again recursively so you can modify the cost method. Right. Uh, this time, uh, when you uh, modify the cost method, you're going to pass in a list of some kind. I'm using list here. Um, you can replace that with a array list if you want to. Um, Later on, you'll realize you can just use list here. Similarly here. Right. Um, so uh, I claim that you can solve it this way if you start by calling cost uh, with an empty list called moves, right? And let the cost method fill in the list moves uh, with the sequence of moves. So um, I'll let you try to, I'll let you play around with that one. Okay. So that particular problem has a couple of nice properties. So in other words, uh, so um, it, it's obvious that you can solve this using recursion, assuming you understand recursion, right? So the uh, so one of the nice things about this uh, particular problem is that the every time you take a step, the rest of the problem gets smaller, right? So the board gets smaller every time you make a move. There's some other nice things, uh, another other nice properties about this game that make it easy to solve with recursion, right? You can never move to the same square twice. So this particular game, you can't move left or right. You can't, uh, sorry, you can only move to the right. You can't move to the left, right? And similarly, uh, it's impossible to fall off the end of the board in this particular game. So if I remove those two things, uh, can you uh, solve the resulting problem? Right. So. Let's look at the next problem. <laughs> All right, so looks like a similar kind of game. I'm going to start at the left and try to get to the right. Right, the right is always marked with a zero. Everything else is always marked with a positive value. Uh, this time, the value in the square that tells you how many steps uh, you can uh, you must make uh, when you're on that square. Right, and now you can move left or right. And the answer is, is can you always get to the, uh, or can you always get to the right-hand side of the board? Right, uh, you're never allowed to jump outside of the board. Right, so starting at this two, I can't move two positions to the left. Right, I can only move two positions to the right. And similarly, when I get to the four, uh, well, I can't move four positions to the left because that would fall off the end of the board. So I can only move four positions to the right. Right. So for this particular board, this one of the solutions uh, looks as follows. Right, starting at the two, I have no choice. I must move to the four. Right, when I get to the four, I have no choice. I must move to the one. And now I have a choice. Right, I can go to the two or the six. So I'm going to go to the six. Right, when I get to the six, I can't go six squares to the right, so I have to go left. Right. Oops, sorry. I have to go left to the three. Right. I can't go left, so I have to go to the five. And when I get to the five, I can jump to the zero, right? So there is at least one solution on this particular board, right? Turns out there's uh, more than one. So if I go to the four, then to the one. Now I can go left instead of going right. So now I go to the two. Now I could go to the six, uh, but I can also go to the two, right? And when I get to the two, I can go to the three. And now we know the rest of the answer because I'm going to go to the five and then the zero. Now, in this particular game, um, it is possible to end up going around and around and around in circles. Right. So if I end up at that two and I jump to this two, right, I can always go back to the other two. Right. And now I can go around and around and around and around. Right. Um, and if you're not careful when you're writing down the solution to this method, you end up in a situation where you never stop. Right. You just keep on going around and around in circles. Right. And if you have cycles on your board, it's easy to produce a board where there's no solution. 
right? So that particular board is impossible to get to the zero, right? You just end up going around and around and around. So it looks like we're also going to have to figure out, is there a, uh, uh, you're gonna have to detect whether or not there's cycles uh, or you're in a cycle when you're trying to solve the problem. Right. And on this particular board, it doesn't matter what you end up doing. Uh, you eventually end up on a one, on that one there, right? And that one forces you into a cycle of some kind. Right? There's no way out. And even without a cycle, it's trivially easy to make a board where no solution exists. Right? So starting at the one, I have to go to the 100. Oh, sorry. Right? I have to go to the 100. Right. Once you land on the hundred, there's no solution. Right. I fall off the board no matter what. Okay. So in this particular version of the game, right, it doesn't look like the board gets smaller every time you take a step, right? Because you go left or right, right? So you're not removing part of the board every time you uh, make a move, right? But it turns out the board does in fact get smaller. Right. If the board didn't get smaller, you would not be able to uh, formulate a recursive solution to the problem. Right. Recursion relies on the fact that your problem size always gets smaller. Right. Because you're going to continuously call the method or the function, right, until you reach a point where you know the answer. Right. If the size of your problem keeps on growing or never does not is not guaranteed to get smaller every time, your recursive solution is not guaranteed to reach a base case. So I claim that this problem does in fact get smaller every time. Right. Does anybody see how the problem gets smaller? Right. It has to do with this cycling thing, right? And so the idea is um, you can detect whether or not you're in a, you know you're in a cycle if you end up landing on the square that you've already visited, right? You want to prevent getting into a cycle, Right, and so you want to rule out all solutions that bring you back to a square you've already been on. Right, that means every time you take a step, right, you rule out one position on the board every time. Right, so the board gets smaller by one every time you make a step. So it looks like it might be possible to find a recursive solution. Now the problem is um, we need to somehow indicate that you've landed on a square before. OK, so for this particular problem, I'm going to solve it backwards. Normally, when you solve a recursive problem, you start at the base cases, right? Uh, but you don't have to solve it that way. So you can start with the recursive cases um, if you want to, right? And so if you think about this problem recursively, right? So you're on a square, right? The first question you want to ask is, is can I go left? Right? Because you might fall off the board, right, if you go left. So can you move left without falling off the board? Right. If the answer is yes, then you want to know, OK, so if I move left, can I solve the board? Right. So there's your recursive call right there. If I can move left, I'm going to try to solve the board by taking one step to the left. You have a second choice, though, at every square. Right. Can you move right without falling off the board? Right. If you can, well, I'm going to recursively call the method and try to solve the board after moving right. Right, by the uh, by the um, specified number of squares. Right, so the I'm going to solve this uh, method. I'm going to solve this problem using the following method. Right, so the method is called is solvable. It's going to return true if the board is solvable when you start at that index there. Right. It's going to return false if the board is uh, not solvable when starting at that index there. Right, the board is just going to be represented using a list of some kind. So I guess I'll finish this off in the next lecture because um, we're basically out of time.